100 years of trailblazing, 100 years of striving, from extreme poverty to a well-off society, from a sleeping giant to a responsible global power. Mission and vision on the past and into the future. Decoding the Communist Party of China. Centenary and beyond, only on CGTN. We continue our special series Centenary and Beyond to mark 100 years since the founding of the Communist Party of China. We look back over the party's history and mission with our reporters, bringing you stories from the past and present. And we get insights from experts on what drives the party in fulfilling its present mission. And today we report from Shanghai and Hainan on how the party has led China's transformation from backwater to global economic powerhouse. And we'll walk you through the places we've been to in the past several days following the footsteps of the CPC towards the future development of China. Today we're going to talk to three reporters, Yang Chengxi in Shanghai, Li Jianhua in the city of Haikou in the southern province of Hainan, and Tang Bo at the Great Wall here in Beijing. Yang Chengxi and Li Jianhua will take a look at the transformations in these places of the past 100 years, especially after the reform and opening up. And Tang Bo is at the Great Wall, as we mentioned, to give us a review of the journey in the past several days. I will talk to you later, gentlemen. But well, before we talk to our reporters, let's first take a look at how the CPC built up its uh, strength from a small band of men and women to today's world's biggest and one of the most successful political parties. Cui Huiao tells us more. When the CPC was founded in 1921, it was a small party of some 50 members. But a century later, the party has grown into one of the world's largest ruling parties with a membership of more than 91 million. Many experts believe the CPC's success comes from its members. They have formed a powerful force which has helped China overcome challenges and achieve progress. Zhao Yulu was one such model party member. He was party chief of Lankau County in Henan province. At age of 42, he died at his post. On the row of CPC members, he once said, quote, they should appear in front of the people when they are facing the most difficult situations, and when they need help the most. Ru Zhenggang is another party member and a leading Chinese expert in hybrid weed. I've experienced hunger before, so I know how important food is. It became my goal to keep people away from hunger and to have enough to eat. That was my aspiration. But how can party members ensure the spirit and mission of the CPC is carried forward? The answer lies in the younger generation. Today, about one-third of current CPC members are under the age of 40. In 2019, nearly 80 percent of new party members admitted were below the age of 35. That means the younger generation now plays a pivotal role in propelling the party's growth. And many of them are well aware of their responsibilities. Whether one's goal is to be a good person or to achieve career goals, we should learn to be altruistic. We should also be determined to take on responsibilities and then to make contributions to society. As a member of the Communist Party of China, like President Xi Jinping said, I think we should remain true to our original aspiration for our anti-drug police officers this means sticking around in our posts and protecting the people. For the CPC, the centenary only marks the beginning. Going forward, the party says it will continue its journey to develop China into a prosperous and modern nation. We live in a fast-changing world, and the CPC sure faces numerous challenges and difficulties ahead. But the past century has proven that no matter how history evolves, what remains unchanged is this ethos of CPC members. Those I've spoken to say they stay true to their original aspirations and are dedicated to revitalizing the country. And they believe these qualities will help the party weather any storms in the future. Cui Huiao, CGTN, Beijing. 
All right, now let's uh, talk to our reporters. Uh, I will start with you, Cheng Xi. You are in Shanghai, the financial hub of China. So could you please remind us how it's regained its role as an international metropolis over the years? Hi, Dong Ning. Shanghai is indeed separated into two parts by the Huangpu River. West of the river is the traditional part of Shanghai. The first CPC National Congress that founded the Communist Party of China was held in this part of the city. But behind me, on the east side of the river, is the skyscraper-filled Pudong District, a relatively new area with a remarkable history. When the country embraced reform and opening up in 1979, business with the outside world grew. And China needed to attract global companies and investors. So in 1990, it decided to develop this patch of land in Shanghai into a new economic icon. And the way to achieve this is through continued policy reforms. Now, I can mention two of them. For example, since 2019, Shanghai's major ports, including the Yangshan Deep Water Port in Pudong, have used blockchain technologies to realize a completely paperless clearance process, which greatly enhanced efficiency. Now, Shanghai has been the world's biggest port in terms of cargo volume for 11 years in a row. Another example is finance. Nine out of the world's top 10 asset management firms have set up shops in the Pudong area, and they are seeing greater opportunities as well. Last year, China further opened up fund management sectors for foreign players by scrapping ownership limits and processing their applications for public fund licenses. By 2025, the zone is expected to have over 1,200 financial institutions. Experts say the success of Pudong is proof that forward-looking reforms have been the pillars of the country's development. Here's a story on how Shanghai continues to deepen its reforms and how these measures are expanding to other areas of China. Shanghai is a city of skyscrapers and the crown jewel of China's economic rise over the past 40 years. Since 2013, China has launched a free trade zone in Shanghai that's propelled policy reforms in many areas. Here are three of them. Number one, pro-business reforms. Thanks to an investment negative list, which promises to shrink over time, global companies are able to come in and invest in more and more areas of business. On the other hand, establishing a company locally has become much easier. Business can apply for various approvals and consultations at our general counters. They don't have to run back and forth between different departments anymore. Also, over half of our services can now be done over our internet portal. Number two, attracting global talents. This includes lowering the age and work experience requirements for foreigners who apply for work permits in the city. This will be very useful for many companies with international backgrounds. Actually, my team is composed by 21 nation, different nationalities, but uh, we need the most support to get talents from all around the world. Number three, supporting high-tech innovation. The Star Market, a new board in Shanghai that provides registration-based listing, was launched in 2019 and has helped high-tech oriented companies raise about 56 billion US dollars in their IPOs. Advanced microfabrication equipment is one of more than 280 companies currently listed. Before we listed, it was very difficult to secure fundings. We had to go from fans to fans to find financiers that understood and had confidence in this industry. The successful results of these reforms have given China the confidence to expand them to other regions. One of them is much bigger than Shanghai. The government has designated the entire island province of Hainan a free trade port in 2020. Many experiences of Shanghai have been applied in Hainan. For example, all custom clearance procedures in Hainan can be applied and processed on one platform called the single window. Today, custom clearance time in Hainan is half that of 2017. An investment negative list in Hainan also serves to lower business barriers. In the year leading to this June, 190,000 new companies were launched in the province. Hainan has been experimenting with a new policy in the healthcare sector too. At the town of Boao, medical companies can get special licenses to import drugs and equipment not yet approved in the Chinese mainland. It's a policy not available anywhere else in China. 
Since the launch of Hainan's free trade port, there have been substantial developments thanks to policy innovations. We have benefited a lot. Many Chinese people can come here for new medicines and medical services. The reforms in Shanghai and Hainan encompass many more areas such as finance and social governance, and they are going to help define China's economic future. Yang Chongxi, CCTN, Shanghai. All right. Uh, speaking about China's uh, opening up, uh, South China's Hainan is absolutely worth mention. And it's been a year since the island province was uh, designated as the first free trade port in China. So let's uh, cross over to Jianhua. Jianhua, hello there. What do you have for us in that regard? Yes, Tony, but before I get started, I think Chengqi is right and much of Shanghai's governing experience has been moved over to Hainan, including customs clearance and also the development of its healthcare sector. But there is much more about Hainan's new status as a free trade port or free trade island or province, I would like to call it. Chief among them, one of the most notable changes we have witnessed over the past year, or past a few years actually, is its high-end tourism, in which yacht tourism is considered a benchmark. And the port regulators in Hainan mapped out plans three years ago to make sure that yacht tourism would account for over 10% of Hainan's overall tourism sector's income. So now I'm sitting at the rudder. Of course, everything on the dashboard has been shut down yeah, for security concerns, and I'm not driving as the captains are driving uh, downstairs at this point. So now we are cruising at a speed of around one knot. It is not very fast so that we can enjoy the beautiful coastal line on either side of this river. And of course, let me see what they have on the dashboard. And this is a a horn I can see here. Let's see if I can do that. Oh, can you hear that? <laughs> of course, apart from a tourism development, which is already considered an economic pillar of this province, there were so many other preferential policies ever since it was upgraded into a free trade port. And these include scrapping import duties for multiple products and also uh, lowering the tax rate for high-end professionals to attract talent over to work on this island, of course, capping a company tax rate at 15%, which is considered actually a magnet, attracting so many enterprises to set up branches on this island province. And of course, last but not least, that is relaxing visa requirements for uh, regular visitors or tourists to this island, as well as business professionals. And donning the latest a uh, document concerning the construction of Hainan Free Trade Port aims at uh, liberalize cross-border trades or cross-border flows of trade, investment, capital and personnel. All in all, this all aims to make sure that Hainan will be integrated further with the world economy. On the other hand, Dong we have to say that Hainan's provincial capital, GDP, is not among the highest and most of the time it is on the bottom. But we have to say it is set to change given all the preferential policies granted to this island. And I guess we'll have to wait and see what will happen to this mm -hmm. province in the next 15 or 30 years. Back to you, Dongning. Thank you indeed very much, um, Jianhua. Li Jianhua reporting from Haikou in Hainan province in China's southernmost. And after seeing the economic achievements in Shanghai and Hainan over the past decades, we come to the final stop in our series on the Communist Party of China ahead of uh, its 100th anniversary. And our reporter Tang Bo is joining us from the Great Wall here in Beijing. Tang Bo, hello there. So as we look back over our journey celebrating the party centenary, what are are the highlights. Hi, Dongling. Well, this is the Great Wall of China that almost everyone in the world, I would say, is familiar with. It was built across the northern borders of ancient China to protect the country against nomadic groups of Eurasian steppe. It is one of the largest construction projects the world has ever seen, and its winding path over steep mountains takes in some great scenery. For the most part, it protected China from outside aggression for thousands of years, until 1840, when Western powers broke in. And 81... All right, that was Tang Bo reporting from the Great Wall of uh, Great Wall in Beijing. And uh, 
Beijing has been it has been raining in Beijing uh, today, so that's why the Great Wall is uh, clouded rather severely today. And uh, let's uh, talk to uh, our guest today in the studio, Mr. Wang Xinsong, an associate professor from the School of Social Development and Public Policy under the Beijing Normal University, for more about this subject. Well, as we've seen, the skylines of the uh, Shanghai and also the yacht industry in Hainan were beyond people's imagination decades ago, along with many other great achievements happening in China in these uh, decades indeed. So do you think it's fair to say that the history in China chose the Communist Party of China? Well, you know what, uh, I have been following these uh, episodes in the past week or so, and it's quite an amazing journey to look at China growing from a low historical point to where we are today. You know, in the 1920s and 30s, you know, there were quite a few uh, ideologies floating around the world and competing with each other, including liberalism, capitalism, nationalism, fascism, and communism. So we tried a few of them, and uh, they didn't work out. And China was just out of the Great Revolution. We were poor, divided, we were primarily agrarian, uh, and uh, the society was oppressed by feudalism. Mm. But more importantly, China was under invasion. Right. The imperial powers were covering up some of the substantial territories. Uh, so China needed unity and independence. And uh, to do so requires us to fight against feudalism and imperialism. Uh, pretty much a revolution, mm. you know. So when the Soviet Revolution succeeded, and when the Soviets adopted Marxism, Leninism, the Chinese political elites were very much inspired. That they argued that we could also, we we actually needed a mm. strong political party that can lead China out of being humiliated, mm. to be independent, to be mm. strong. Mm. But to be sure, CPC wasn't the only political party that adopted Marxism and Leninism back then. But there are several factors that I think are very important to explain why the party has eventually won out and uh, continue to deliver uh, the productive development in China. Number one, I think the party is strictly disciplined. Uh, it takes organizational building very seriously. It ensures that the party members are ideologically aligned. It cultivates the able bureaucrats who are able to govern well um, and it, it also tries hard to keep the party clean. Mm. You know, so all these factors uh, you know, contribute to the legitimacy that people give to the ruling party. Second, I think the party is a very adaptive and learning organization. You know, it's good at self-improvement to keep up with the changing situation. Initially, it, governed, uh, it learned to govern the rural areas before, uh, during the revolutionary era. And then after 49, it had to learn to govern from an urban center and transform China into an industrial power. And then it adopted the Soviet model, but adapted to the Chinese reality. And it, it never hesitates to learn from the West about its development experience. So the learning capacity is quite strong. And uh, thirdly, I think the party has always kept this mission of placing the country's interests above anything else. You know, the list is long and I, I can go on, but these three factors, self-discipline, uh, strong learning and adaptive capacity, and placing countries' interests above anything else, uh, are very important to understand why the party has been able to deliver and why the party has been resistant in front of so many crises it has experienced. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, today, as we all know, that, that uh, the, uh, China issued a white paper on China's uh, political party right. system and uh, basically it describes the whole party uh, political party system in China as being new and uh, I understand uh, this word new not only refers to the form of mm -hmm. this political system but also the vigorous vitality that the system has mm -hmm. uh, so the question is how to maintain being new with the change of times that's right. I think the three factors I, uh, I mentioned are needlessly to say that they're very important to be, uh, to be followed in the, in the coming decades. Um, but it's not easy. You know, keeping the party clean uh, is critical but difficult. Uh, and uh, being adaptive all the time and learning 
uh, can also be risky because you don't know whether any policy experiments can go wrong. Um, uh, and, and, and also uh, uh, keeping the party integ uh, integrated with the entire society is also a very hard job to do. Uh, but overall, I think uh, there is a strong confidence, and I think the CPC deserves it, that the Chinese people have full trust and support of the Communist Party. And to make it a leading party, to lead China continue to be a strong and prosperous country, so that China can also share its benefits with the inter international community. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Wang Xinsong from uh, Beijing Normal University. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your insight. Well, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. So under the leadership of the CPC, China has witnessed uh, dramatic changes over the years. So what do Chinese people expect from the future? As a music teacher, I hope the country will invest more in artistic education. The students will get to better understand the beauty of art and enhance their artistic accomplishments. I hope our country will see a big leap in technological development. We can research and produce more high-tech products at a world-leading level. I believe China's financial market will be more robust. It will be more open to foreign banks and insurance companies. I moved to Beijing to work. Despite the COVID-19 epidemic, I hope the country's economy will be continuously boosted and ordinary people will have better lives here. I think China should just follow its own path with calmness and confidence to become the best version of ourselves. Nothing outside can disrupt us. I'm quite delighted and proud to be Chinese, as I saw the Shenzhou 12 manned spaceship mission is operating successfully. The CPC leaders are down to earth. I'm very satisfied with their work and optimistic about the future. And now let's try again to connect with our reporter Tang Bo, who is standing by at the Great Wall in Beijing to see how the line is working. Let's, uh, all right, Tang Bo, can you hear me this time? Okay, Hello again, Zhong Ning. We uh, look as, back as we on look the past back over our journey the celebrating CPC the party centenary, Tang Bo, tell us days. the highlights. Well, yes, the first stop, the site of the first National Congress of the CPC, where we got a much better understanding of the th uh, three founding missions of the party, advancing the modernization drive, achieving national reunification, and safeguarding world peace, and promoting common development. In Shihaigu district of Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region, we learned about how poverty alleviation campaigns were carried out and how much the region has changed because of it. We reported on China's latest manned space mission in Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center, where three astronauts were successfully sent to China's space station Kuomadu in mid-June, kicking off their three-month trip in the orbit. We also went back to Wuhan, where the world saw China's determination and high efficiency in combating the COVID-19 epidemic. And in Xiaogang Village, Anhui Province, we looked into the household responsibility system, which led to a rapid growth of agriculture. And today, China has resolved the problem of feeding its population of 1.4 billion people, more than 20% of the world's population. And in Shenzhen, the front line of China's opening up policies and home to China's first and largest electronics market, we looked at the core spirit of the city, the pursuit of innovation, something the CPC has been committed to. Now, the journey began with reviewing the party's founding missions, which set the tone for every single step taken over the past century. And now we are bringing the program to a close. We have been telling China stories through various shows and reports, but this program is more compelling since China's growth and transformation under the leadership of the CPC is a global story, not only of now, but likely of the foreseeable future. Now, history tells us that the CPC has provided China with confidence and competence to build on its strength 
and address its challenges. And we are happy to showcase the party's most memorable moments of the past 100 years, moments we hope resonate with the global audience. The 100-year anniversary of the founding of the CPC marks a brand new start for the party and the country. And under the Belt and Road Initiative, the CPC aims to lead China to fly over this wall, the Great Wall, and build a bridge to connect China to the whole world. Back to you, Donny. It is indeed a pity to see this 11-day special series of Centenary and Beyond comes to an end, Tambo. But uh, brilliant episodes showing uh, the great achievements happening in China in the past decades. Indeed, Thank you very much, Tambo, reporting from the Great Wall in Beijing. And uh, as Tambo said, future matters a lot. Uh, as the journey into the second century starts, the CPC continues to lead Chinese people to deepen its reforms as they aim to achieve another 100-year goal to build China into a great modern socialist country.